Hi everybody, my name is Joel Vanderwell. I'm one of the pastors here at Incarnation. We hope that you're having a wonderful 4th of July weekend. Happy Independence Day to all of you. And whether that means that you're up at the cabin or you're with family camping or on a vacation or just wanted to stay home and relax today, uh, we hope you are having a wonderful, joyful celebration of uh, Independence Day and spending some good time with family and friends. Uh, knowing that our worship service today is going to be held outside and that we're not able to live stream it, we thought it might be helpful to pre-record uh, the sermon that I'll give. So and in our little time together today during worship, um, we'll hear a sermon and we'll spend some time in prayer and then we'll take communion together. So if you have some communion supplies ready, uh, if you need to pause on the video, go ahead and do that now to get your communion uh, supplies ready, because uh, after the sermon, we'll move right into communion, okay? As we get ready to uh, prepare ourselves to hear God's word today, let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, we give you thanks for this day, for a chance to gather as your people in worship we thank you for the gift of technology that allows us to stay connected to one another even when we're apart. We pray now that your Holy Spirit would come upon us, that it would open up our hearts and our minds to receive what it is that you have for us today, to help us to reimagine a way forward in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. About four years ago, Brian McLaren, an author that we've quoted many times here at church, uh, wrote this book called Why Don't They Get It? Uh, it's just a short little book, and it started with him exploring some of these hard issues that we experience in culture today. He was trying to wrestle with um, the political nature of what's happening in the U.S. and how it seems to just be ripping us apart. Really, what jump-started this journey for him was something that happened back in 2017. Maybe you remember uh, that Unite the Right uh, rally that took place in Charlottesville, Virginia uh, in 2017, and Brian was there. He was part of a clergy-led resistance to what was happening there, and while he was there, he was one of the ones who witnessed when that white nationalist drove through the crowd and killed a person and injured so many others. He couldn't understand why there was so much vitriol within uh, the area where he was. He, he couldn't fathom why people would have so much distrust. And so he wanted to explore this and, and create resources for people to help uh, explore ways that we can move forward with it. Out of that came this book that he wrote. The next year, he started a podcast with some friends going through some of these uh, things that he explored in his book. The podcast is called Learning How to See. <laughs> Isn't that a great title? Learning How to See. And that's exactly what McLaren was seeking to do, to help others learn to see things differently. Within this book, he talks about 13 different biases that we all have as a culture. 13 things that may blind us uh, from the world around us. And, and so oftentimes we don't even realize that we have them until someone points it out to us. And I think, I think that this isn't just something new today in the 21st century. But I think for centuries, for millennia, people have struggled with biases. Things that prevent them from seeing others around them. It's, it's as if we have blinders on and, and can't completely see the world the right way. And so Brian McLaren wrote this book. And not only does he share and define those 13 different biases, but he also gives responses of, of ways we can overcome those biases. He uses stories from the Gospels talking about how he sees Jesus overcoming each one of those biases himself. Now, I imagine you can guess where I'm going with this. In our story that we're going to look at today, we see one of those biases come out. It's called contact bias. Contact bias is basically the sense that if I refuse to be around other people who are different than me, 
then there's no reason for me to change. I can still hold on to the prejudices that I have. And that's exactly what we see happen in the early church. They struggled to move outside of themselves. In our story today, the Apostle Peter, the one who is leading that early church, actually has a vision that opens his eyes to something new that Jesus is doing. And so if you have your Bibles, we're in Acts chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Here are these words from the book that we love. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon at about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? The angel answered, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him. And after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. Let's pause there just for a second. The first character that we meet is a man by the name of Cornelius. And he lives in the city of Caesarea, which is still in Palestine. One of the things to remember in the first century is that not only Jews lived in Israel and in Palestine, but also Gentiles. Roman soldiers, like this centurion, lived in Israel. Israel was occupied by the Roman government. Not only were there Roman citizens there, but there were other people who lived there from all around the world. Maybe you remember throughout the Old Testament how many times the Jewish people had to be exiled from the Babylonians or the Assyrians. And whenever they were exiled, other people moved into their land. So fast forward hundreds and thousands of years, and now it's, it's not just Jewish people living in the land of Israel, but it's non-Jewish people, Gentiles who are gathered there, and, and they're trying to figure out how they can live together. Oftentimes it didn't go real well. And there was a lot of biases and prejudices that began to be formed over that time. Now despite all that, somehow Cornelius began to believe in Yahweh. He began to be a practicing Jew. You can hear it in here, that he prayed fervently to God. He was one who feared God, meaning that he was one who wanted to obey whatever it is that God told him to do. Not only that, but he was generous with what he had. He gave alms to those who were in need, those who were Gentile and those who were Jewish. This was a devout person practicing Judaism at this time, even though ethnically he wasn't Jewish. This is who Peter is called to be in a relationship with. Let's read on to hear what it is that Peter experiences at the same time. About noon the next day, as those people from Cornelius' household were making their way to Joppa, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven opened and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again a second time, What God has made clean you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up into heaven. In the story, Peter has this grand vision of a sheet full of all kinds of animals, those that were clean for him to eat and those that were not clean for him to eat. In the midst of this, Jesus calls to him and says, Peter, Kid up, kill, and eat. And Peter is so overwhelmed by this idea, so astounded that, that this is something he could do, he, he 
fights back a little bit. Something we've seen Peter do many times with Jesus in the past. He says, by no means, Lord. By no means. I have never eaten anything profane or unclean. And here's the thing. That word profane there isn't meant to be a synonym to unclean. It's actually a completely different category that Peter is talking about. Actually, in Greek, the word really means common. And so what Peter says is, I have never eaten anything common or profane. Now here's what he means by this. In his whole life, he lives in eating world in this world where he's only eating things what we would call kosher. Right? You may know some Jewish people who eat this way. There's another level of food that's known as common food. And another level of food outside of that that would be considered unclean. So in the unclean category, this is food that you probably are already thinking of, things like pork. You know that Jewish people wouldn't eat things that are uh, like pigs, that sort of thing. But the common category is something that's a little bit trickier for, uh, for us to maybe grasp or to kind of understand. Um, this would be food that would probably be okay for them to eat. So like lamb, you know, something as simple as that. You know that Jewish people can eat something like lamb. The problem is, is that in the cities, in the cities where they live, there are Gentiles there who would be selling animals or selling cooked meat like lamb. But the Jewish people don't know if that lamb had already been sacrificed to another deity. And so what they would do is rather than purchasing that lamb, they would refuse to buy it and would only buy from other Jewish people. They begin to build up these barriers. And so when Peter's talking about, Lord, I have never eaten anything common or unclean, he's talking about these two categories here about things that may be legal for him to eat just by the food they are, but because they might be associated with things that are, that are unclean, he refuses to eat them. Over time, you can imagine how that would um, create some distrust and some disloyalty and some barriers and some prejudices between the Jewish people and the Gentile people that they don't trust what the Gentile people are doing. I remember a, a number of years ago, I was flying from Kenya back home to the United States after visiting my sister, and I decided to buy something in the airport. Some, uh, some, actually, it was some beer uh, for a present for my father-in-law. And I bought it, and it was in the little duty-free sack that they sealed in the Nairobi airport. And when we landed in Amsterdam and we had to go through uh, customs once, you, once again, they took away those beverages, even though it was sealed, even though I had bought it at an airport. They didn't trust the people in Nairobi. Why didn't they trust them? Nairobi, maybe you know, this is a very modern city with a very modern airport. There's no reason for this mistrust to take place between the people of Nairobi and the people of Amsterdam. But yet, because they're so far apart, because they don't continue to spend time with one another, learning about one another's cultures, there is this distrust that begins to be built. Peter finds himself in that same place that he does not have a sustained, ongoing relationship with Gentiles, and so he, he doesn't trust them. And so for this vision for him to have of Jesus calling him out on this and saying, don't call anything common that I have already made clean, convicts Peter to his core. He recognizes that things aren't the way they're supposed to be. 
And so as the story goes on, eventually the centurion's friends come and they find Peter. And Peter wakes up from this vision and he rushes downstairs and he brings them into the house and they begin to eat together. Later on in chapter 10, he continues and goes back to Caesarea and he enters into the house of Cornelius. And as he enters in, he even <laughs> names the tension that he feels, saying that you know it is unlawful for a Jew to enter into the home of a Gentile, but because of what the Lord has shown me, I am here. He realizes the difference between common and kosher no longer exists, but that all are welcome into the family of God, that the circle continues to get wider and continues to get bigger. E.B. White, the children's author who wrote Charlotte's Web and Stuart Little, has this great line where he talks about prejudices. He says, prejudice is a great time saver. You can form opinions without getting facts. <laughs> Isn't that great? Prejudice is a great time saver. You can form opinions without getting facts. Friends, it takes a long time to break down those prejudices. It takes a long time to build those relationships with people who are different than us. God is up to something new in the book of Acts. God is ready to break down those barriers, those things that separate us from one another. God is ready to break open the world around us so that we might break down those prejudices within ourselves. And so maybe some of the questions we need to reflect on today are what are those prejudices within our own hearts that we're holding on to? Those things that we think of when we see somebody who looks different than us. Do we have people in our lives like a Cornelius who is willing to journey with us and walk alongside us in spite of those prejudices that we hold in order to open us up to something new? That's the invitation for us today, to reimagine a new way forward, to break down those barriers between us so that all can come to know who Jesus is. Let's pray together. Holy and loving God, we give you thanks that you are the one who breaks down prejudices. You are the one who allows us to open our eyes to see something new. And so we pray that you would continue to walk alongside us, that you would help us to look at those who are different than us as your beloved children, that we can break down that contact bias and overcome it so that new relationships can be formed. Lord God, we thank you for people in our lives who are already doing that for us, for those uh, neighbors and friends that have already helped us to recognize that those first thoughts we had weren't right. We pray that you would help us to remain humble and that when we mess up, that we would be able to ask for forgiveness and allow your grace to overwhelm us so that it can flow out into the relationships of those around us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we just talked about, Peter welcomed Cornelius' friends to eat with him. When Peter went to Cornelius' house, Cornelius welcomed him to eat with them. Friends, this table of communion is meant for all people. This is the place where Jesus meets us. He is the host of this meal, and so we invite you to partake and to join in this good food with us. On the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. As often as you eat of it, do so remembering me. In the same manner, after they had eaten supper, Jesus took the cup, and he blessed it, saying, This cup is a new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins for all people. As often as you drink of it, do so remembering me. The bread which we break and the cup which we bless are the communion of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, who teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, taste and see that the Lord is good. The body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Friends, thank you for worshiping with us today online. It's been good to gather together and we're grateful for this gift of technology uh, and for Emily Turner for helping to make this possible. We're so grateful for her work. I invite you now to receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look, lift his face upon you and give you his peace, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.